So what I want us all to do, shake one limb, either an arm or a leg, whatever you want to, and then you can sit back down. Okay. And I'm not at all offended if you need to get up in the middle of me talking and get yourself some more coffee or whatever, um, it's, it's totally cool. So yeah, I'm Rick Ralston and I'm uh, a therapist in Hillsboro. I work for Life Stands Health. And um, I actually quit a job at Legacy Health System that I'd been in for a long time because I wasn't doing what I really wanted to. And that was do full-time counseling. So the last five and a half years I've been at Life Stands Health and I'll be there till the day I die or I retire sometime. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about how in the world do you get from anxiety to joy? And you know, as Stacy and I talked about what we could talk about here, I thought that's a really, really good topic because we're all living in, um, in a world that just the normal circumstances of life create anxiety and create, creates worry. So how in the world do we get from anxiety over here all the way to joy that sometimes we feel like it's way over here? How do we do that? That's what we're going to talk about. So I found this really cool um, little thing from the Productivity Institute about how, um, this is Americans, how average Americans spend our time. And I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to read the top five. Number five, looking for lost stuff. How many of you spend a lot of time looking for lost stuff? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was number five. Number four, um, watching commercials. Um, that, was, that was number four. Um, that was before DVR, I think, where you can fast forward. Um, number three, waiting in lines. How many of you hate waiting in lines? Yeah, it really sucks. Um, number two, out of actually a very long list, was worrying. Number two, and this was from an institute that looks at productivity and how do we spend our time. Number two on the whole list was worrying. Now you're probably wondering what number one was. Um, <laughs> number one was spending time in the bathroom. <laughs> for real, for real. <laughs> Folks, worrying and anxiety is a very normal thing. So we just need to address it and realize this is a big deal. So we're going to talk about what's God's intent for us, and then we're going to talk about what is anxiety, and we'll kind of go through that quickly because we all live it. Then we're going to talk about what causes anxiety, and then we're going to talk about how do you first stop that, that process so that we can get to where we'll spend most of our time, and so what do you do about it? And we're going to get real practical here. So what's God's intent? You know, it's one of those big questions that we, of course, are not going to answer here, why do bad things happen to good people? And there's lots of good books on that. Um, the scriptures talk a lot about that. But I think what we can say here is, yes, God intends good for you. And if you're going through a difficult time, I think that's an important place for us to start, is that God intends good for you. God wants you to experience peace and joy. When Heather was talking, I just was laughing because, so I'm going to quote the same scripture she did. And my, my thought for years and years has been, if we hear something twice, it's probably because it was really important. So in Psalms 23, just like Heather talked about, it does talk about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And just like Heather talked about, that shadow, that sense of, I'm in so much anxiety, so much worry. It's like the shadow of death is right there. You know what's fascinating about Psalms 23? A few verses later, God's given us the picture of our cup overflowing, our cup of goodness overflowing, our cup of joy overflowing. So that's God's intent that when life happens, where we, we feel like we're going through the valley of the shadow of death, God wants to help us get to that cup overflowing. John 10.10 10, it's one of my favorite verses in, in counseling. Um, uh, you know, it's one of the things I always do um, on intake is to see where people are at spiritually and when people want to talk about spiritual stuff, we very much do that. And this is one of the verses I always talk about. God said, I have come that you might have life. But you know what's really fascinating about that? He didn't stop there. God didn't say, I've, I've come that you might have life. God said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. 
Isn't that fascinating? God doesn't want us to just kind of survive through life. God wants us to have an abundant life. So how do you get to the abundant life? That's what we want to talk about. The abundant life is when you feel joy. So what's anxiety? Did you know that the average person, so if you're average, whatever average is, we have about 25,000 thoughts a day that run through our mind. Isn't that just nuts when you think about that? Now, the good news is most of those are unconscious or we're, we'd all be, you know, in the inpatient psychiatric hospital. Um, only a few of those are, only about 3% of those are conscious, but still, if you think of 3% of 25,000, we have a ton of stuff going on up here. And actually, I tried to find some silly putty at the store. I wanted to spray some silly putty because um, that's really what our mind is like. It's dirty all over the place, kind of like silly putty. Um, Stacy, you can thank me. The only thing I could find was foam, and I thought, no, that, you know, we'd be cleaning up foam here for the next hour. But think of silly putty. If we sprayed silly putty all over the place, that's kind of how our mind is. It's just going all over the place with these all these thoughts all day long. No wonder that we we get anxious. We're going to talk a lot about the mind. That's where that's where anxiety comes from. It's it's what we're thinking. So if we looked at like generalized anxiety disorder, it's excessive worry about lots of things, and it's it's the difficulty controlling the worry. So it's like, how do you turn it off? I've had I'd be a rich man if I had a buck for every time somebody said, "Rick, my mind's just racing. My mind's just racing." That's anxiety. We can't relax. We feel keyed up. We feel on edge. Lots of physical tensions, physical aches, neck aches, back aches. You feel it in your body. It's why the number one book that came out a number of years ago on trauma, and this is one of the world's leading experts on trauma, he named the book The Body Keeps the Score. Because we st excuse me, we store anxiety and we store trauma in our body. So if you're feeling lots and lots of, of physical tension, you might want to tune into that. Irritability. Um, difficulty concentrating, easily fatigued, um, restlessness, especially impaired sleep where it's just really hard to sleep because you're, you go to bed and you're feeling that anxiety. Um, catastrophizing is real, real common when we're worrying and when we have a lot of anxiety. And what I mean by catastrophizing is we kind of go from a normal worry here all the way to jumping way over here. Just met with somebody yesterday who's, who's a math teacher at a university here in town, and, and his number one issue that he wants help with is catastrophizing. He just can't stop his mind from going here to a worst case scenario. That's real common when we have anxiety. And then um, GI distress. You know, you feel like you have ulcers, um, you feel like you're, you're nauseous, or you just kind of feel like you have butterflies in your stomach all the time. Do you have any of those? How often do you have any of those? If you have a number of those, you're probably experiencing anxiety that, that you want to figure out, okay, what do I do with this? The reason anxiety can be so difficult, let me give you an example from a garden. Many years ago, my wife and I, um, we had a house in actually just a couple, couple um, miles from here where we raised our, our three girls. And my wife loved gardening. And so we got a house that had an oversized backyard. And she, I hate gardening, but I would do the rototill and all that stuff. And she was really, really good at gardening. She planted tomatoes and um, strawberries and beans and potatoes and on and on the list goes. And she planted zucchini. How many of you have ever planted zucchini? So you know where I'm going here. Zucchini will eat the whole garden alive. It just grows like you get up the next morning and it's like, how did the zucchini grow two feet last night? <laughs> zucchini, you know, the strawberries run for cover and the tomatoes run for cover. That's anxiety in our mind. It's kind of like zucchini. <laughs> it's like the anxiety just takes over your mind and after a while, you know, the strawberries can't, can't come out and the tomatoes can't come out and all these good things and the potatoes, all these good things are kind of hidden because the zucchini takes over the garden. That's, that's why this stuff we're talking about is so important. Because anxiety can take over our mind just like, 
our anxiety can take over our mind just like zucchini and it robs us of joy. That's why it's so important for us to pay attention to this stuff. So what causes anxiety? Let's just go through a few. Obviously this isn't inclusive, but of course circumstances. And I want to start with that because many of you in this room have been through very difficult circumstances and we just want to acknowledge that that many times circumstances are going to cause anxiety, relationship conflict, you're feeling out of control, there's uncertainty. Many, many times circumstances are going to cause a lot of anxiety. Maybe on the way over here you have a flat tire. Nothing you could do about that, you just had a flat tire. Circumstances can cause a lot of anxiety. Sometimes biochemical changes in the body. I mentioned trauma a few minutes ago. Um, biochemical changes in your body can cause added anxiety. You feel it in your body. Our mind, you're going to hear this probably the biggest theme. Our mind is very, very powerful. Isn't it interesting that it, in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, as a man or woman thinks, so are we. It didn't say as we feel. It said as we think, so are we. Your mind is incredibly powerful. Let me give you an example. Um, we've all lived through COVID. Um, here we are, so let's talk about COVID for a minute. Did you know that when COVID happened and then the different drug companies started coming out with the vaccines, Johnson & Johnson's first vaccine that they came out with, there was this widespread kind of fear, lots and lots of anxiety that 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 vaccine was going to cause blood clots. And I don't know if you remember, there's a bunch in the news about it. People were scared spitless and they weren't sure if they wanted to take it because is it going to cause me blood clots? You know what the research was? Yes, it could cause a blood clot, but the chances are so small, you actually had two times, you were two times as likely to get hit by lightning as you were to get a blood clot from that vaccine. No, there was not much, not much. And yet our minds will go there. Our mind would think, uh-oh, I, I saw something on the news or I read something, I'm going to get a blood clot. And so we start perseverating about that and worrying about that when actually the chances are, are so low, we shouldn't even be worrying about it for two seconds. There's a really cool book, probably my, one of the best titles I've heard of for an, for an anxiety book, and it's called The Worry Trick. That's actually the name of the book. I can't remember the subtitle, but, but the main title is The Worry Trick. So you are wondering, well, what's The Worry Trick? The trick is that our mind messes with us. Our mind messes with us in the sense of saying, you're in danger. But it's only perceived danger. Lots and lots of anxiety is perceiving that there's danger out there when there's not danger. Now let me very quickly say, especially given what ARMS is all about, you might be in danger. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that a few times. If you're in danger, you very much want to deal with that. You want to have a plan. Um, and we want to acknowledge that. This is different. Sometimes our mind spins out of control thinking we're in danger when actually we're not in danger. Um, and that's where a lot of anxiety can come from. Robert Sapolsky, he, he was a researcher at Stanford. He spent his entire life looking at the results and effects of stress and response. And he wrote a book. Don't you love the title of this book? Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. That's actually the name of his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Um, his conclusion for humans um, regarding anxiety and stress and our response to stress, here's what he said. And this is a guy who has spent his entire um, professional life studying stress and response. His conclusion was, we should not borrow trouble from tomorrow. So much anxiety is catastrophizing out there. That's why the worry trick book is so right. Our mind messes with this. Folks, let's just call it what it is. That's Satan. That's the evil one messing with our mind, saying you're in trouble when you aren't really. And again, let's quickly remind ourselves, if you're in trouble right now, then that's different. You, you want to be getting support, so we'll, and we'll come back to that. But our mind messes with us. Now, I might add, because some of you are probably sitting here wondering, why, why don't zebras get ulcers? Actually, yeah, actually it's for real. Zebras don't get ulcers because their stress response happens in just a few seconds. 
and then it's gone. Isn't that interesting? They're, so I guess they really don't get ulcers because their stress response happens so quickly. It comes and then it leaves really quickly. So I thought some of you are wondering, so I better, better not. I don't want to cause anxiety, you know, with you wondering. <laughs> Sometimes anxiety comes from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or a term we didn't even hear 20 years ago, but now we're at a deeper, deeper understanding, CPTSD. And if you have been through abuse, it's probably CPTSD. That stands for complex PTSD. And what that means is abuse over a period of time or trauma over a period of time. PTSD is more one event um, a, or a short series of events. CPTSD, we now are understanding that's complex post-traumatic stress disorder where when you've been going through these stressors, this trauma over a period of time, it looks a little different, it feels different, and so we need to pay close, close attention to that. So many times your anxiety might be coming from CPTSD. Google it tonight and check it out because there's lots of finally good information coming out about CPTSD. I'm spending lots and lots of time in counseling um, with clients we're, we're looking at CPTSD and what's the results of that because a lot of times that's the the anxiety another cause is uncertainty and loss of control I just mentioned that a few minutes ago our brains don't like uncertainty our, they just don't our brains like certainty so many times if you're finding yourself anxious you can say, is there something that I'm uncertain about? It's why we catastrophize many times from here to here. It's, it's the worry trick. There's, there's some danger out there. If, if we are, are uncertain about a situation, then it's very easy to get um, anxious because we don't know. Um, in abuse situations, it's the same thing. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. The uncertainty of that can cause a tremendous amount of anxiety. That's why we're going to, in just a minute, we're going to start talking about what do you do about it. Um, the last cause is just to remind us, there's lots more, but um, you know, we'd be here all day if we were going to talk about all the things that cause us anxiety. So how do you stop the cycle and to get to joy? Probably the most important thing I could say is to increase your awareness. To increase your awareness of what's going on. When we increase our awareness about something, it allows you to make decisions that you can control. Let me give you an example. Um, I am eight, as of last Thursday, I am eight weeks um, cancer free. And I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I mean, truly, thank you, Jesus. I had prostate cancer that was diagnosed two years ago. And actually, the, the prostate cancer was very slow growing, which is actually real common for prostate cancer. And we were kind of in the watch and wait. The problem that I ran into is that my prostate kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It started pushing into my bladder to where I was peeing 27 times a day, seven to nine times at night. Um, then it started wrapping around my urethra. It was just nuts. And finally, the doctor said, we, we have to get this prostate out of here. And so um, eight weeks ago, I had surgery and actually had some complications because it was so big. Um, he couldn't find his way around. So anyhow, um, he said, don't drive for a couple weeks. And I, I have six incisions here that are mostly healed now, but I had robotic surgery. So, you know, the robots going in and everything. I, I really do have six incisions. It's very interesting. He said, but one of the things he said th the morning after the surgery is, um, don't drive. I'll be seeing you in a week for your follow-up. Um, and I said, well, okay, I really want to get back. I, I, you can probably tell I, I move a lot and I'm a long distance runner and I wanted to get going. But I said, okay. So I went back in a week and I said, so can I drive? And he, and actually my healing was going very, very well. And so he said, let pain be your guide for driving. I thought, well, great. Cause my brother took me to that appointment. So I was in a car and I was fine. And, um, one of my daughters had taken me someplace a couple days before and I was fine. So I thought I'll be really careful driving to not push down the accelerator, the brake too much. Cause I figured, well, that might cause problems here. 
So the next day, I got in the car, and I drove. I, actually, I was going to church. I missed going to church. And within about two miles, it was just killing me. And I actually had to turn around and go back home. It hurt so bad. And I would, so where I'm going is I increase my awareness about what's going on. Check this out. Maybe you guys aren't like me, but what I found, I never knew this in my entire life. When you turn the steering wheel of your car, it actually affects your abdominal muscles. At least it did for me. It was just fascinating. I didn't know that until I dialed into my awareness. I was shocked that it was hurting so bad, and so I really, really tuned into, okay, what's going on here? Am I pushing down the accelerator too much? What's going on? And I could tell every time I turned a corner, and so with my hand was turning the steering wheel, it really hurt here. I didn't figure that out until I really dialed into my awareness for what was going on. Increasing your awareness is a wonderful, wonderful place to start with healing anxiety. What's going on in your mind that causes anxiety? And then you change those thoughts to a bigger, better reward. Something, a healing behavior. So let me give you two examples. Um, a thought that I might have, so I am a long distance runner, I love long distance running, it's how I found arms at a 5k race. Um, I also happen to be a chocoholic, thank goodness I'm a long distance runner. Um, I love M&Ms, I really love M&Ms. Um, so the behavior, what my thought is, I want to eat a whole bag of M&Ms, and I've had that thought many, many times. My behavior would be I'd eat the M&Ms. My result would be that I'd have massive guilt after eating this whole bag of M&Ms. <laughs> Let's use another example. The thought, I'm in an abusive relationship, but I feel like I'm stuck forever. The behavior is you stay in that abusive relationship or you don't set boundaries, you don't do other things. The result is anxiety, depression. The healing starts as you become aware of this process, then you have the power to change and be happy and to get to joy. So let's look at both of these examples. What's a bigger, better reward than eating a whole bag of M&Ms and feeling massive guilt? Well, you know my bigger, better reward? I'm training for Boston Marathon right now. It's 11 weeks from Monday. And I have a very, very high level of motivation to do well. Now, I lost a lot of conditioning because I had to take several weeks off after my surgery. But my bigger, better reward than eating a bag of M&Ms for in the moment feeling good is I actually want to be really, really healthy and take care of my body so that I can train as much as I can. And don't miss what happens next. The result is I actually feel better than if I had eaten those bag of M&Ms and had that, that momentary enjoyment. I feel much better, and I actually do have a bag of M&Ms in my candy cupboard right now. But I, I limit myself to just one handful each evening just for a little treat. <laughs> because in my mind, you see how awareness can change from anxiety or making poor choices to joy? In my mind, I say my bigger, better reward is I, I just feel amazing, just honored to be, be able to go run Boston in 11 weeks. I would rather control my eating M&Ms for my bigger, better reward of being healthy. So now let's look at an abusive situation. Your bigger, better re reward then anxiety and depression and not doing anything might be you set some boundaries or you talk to arms or a counselor or whoever, a friend, and decide what do you need to do to change your situation. The bigger, better reward is you feel calm. You can get to a place of peace. Your sleep improves. You feel increased happiness and joy because you aren't stuck in your situation. The healing happens as you increase your awareness. Acts, 20, Acts 2, 25 to 28 says, I've got this on my phone, so I'm going to pull it out and read it. Um, 
This is really cool. So I'm in Acts 2, 25 to 28. I saw the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, and even my body will also rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So let's unpack that for a sec. I saw the Lord always before me. I will not be shaken. Um, so this isn't a church service, but um, as Stacy talked about, wow, if you've got a foundation in God, that's a great place to start. That's a great place to get from anxiety to joy. Isn't it incredible that these verses said, I saw God always before me. Is the Lord always before you? When that happens, in the next verse was, Therefore my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body will rest in hope. Isn't that interesting? The heart, my heart is glad, that's our emotions. My, my heart is glad, my tongue, my tongue rejoices. In other words, that's talking. We're able to talk um, positivity. And even my body will rest in hope. That's physically. We're able to get a good night's sleep. We're able to rest. We're able to be at a, a place of calm. Because you will not abandon me, and you have made known to me the paths of life, you will fill me with joy in your presence. When you're anxious, how often do, do you get yourself in God's presence? Isn't that powerful? See, those aren't my words. Those are God's words to each one of you. When you're anxious, what do you need to do to get in God's presence? To be able to listen to God. It's kind of like when we talked about going through the valley of the, of, of the shadow of death. Well, you know, many times we've heard, when you're going through hell, keep going. Keep going. And, of course, the scriptures say, then we get to my cup overflows. So, let's talk about some practical solutions. Number one, and let me quickly say again, this is not comprehensive. I'm going I'm to rattle off a whole bunch. Um, it's going to be like a fire hydrant. But, you know, for each, my, my hope is um, that each of you are going to have a couple. And actually, that's going to be your, your assignment when we're all done, is take 30 seconds and write down on the back of the envelope or, or something that you're taking home just two things. So be, be listening for two things. If you're anxious, don't be silent. Break the silence. If you're suffering in a difficult situation, you're going to keep suffering. You possibly are going to keep suffering in high anxiety and worry if you're keeping that all inside. Breaking the silence decreases anxiety, so you don't have to carry that alone. So who are your supports? You have some friends, you have some family, you have arms. Um, whoever that might be, Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Don't be, dis don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I'll help you, I'll uphold you with my righteous hand. Wow, that's an amazing verse. That's just packed with stuff. The message God is giving is He wants you to, to be in His presence. When you do that, and when you break silence so you don't feel like you have to be alone, you know, that's the value of church. That's the value of getting together in arms groups, whatever that, that's like for you to get together. The second thing I would mention is create safety. If you're not in a safe situation, the chances of you being able to be in, a, in an emotional place where you're without anxiety is going to be pretty low. Let, let's just be honest with each other here. You need safety. Once you're safe, once you're feeling safe, it's going to be a lot easier to feel less anxious. So if you're in an unsafe situation, for you, that would be a biggie for you to think about. What do I need to do and who do I need to talk to to get into a safe situation? Because once I am able to feel safe, my anxiety is going to go down. Um, I'm just going to throw this one out and not talk about it. Um, sometimes medications are very important. God gave us physicians to, you know, and people who, people smarter than you and me who were able to develop medications. And I'm here to tell you, 
Um, medications can be a, a part of the healing process. They, they just can. They can take the edge off. Um, what a medication won't do is solve the problem. What a medication can possibly do is help make you feel more like you're able to address the problem. So I'll just leave that with you. Talk with your primary care physician about that or a counselor or whoever. Mindfulness. So we kind of all, you hear the theme of in your mind? Um, we've all heard the jingle mindfulness and I think it's kind of funny since I've been counseling for a really long time. You know, it's, we've been talking about this stuff for years and years, it's just kind of repackaged, but actually it's kind of been repackaged pretty nice. The whole idea of mindfulness is just to slow down and be in the moment, to be present in the moment. Now you see how things, the pieces of the puzzle start fitting together. We just read some verses about God saying, be, be in my presence. That's when you can feel calm. That's when you can feel peace. That's when you can feel joy. Well, mindfulness is just being present in the moment. You're able to set, set aside anxiety and be in the moment. In the moment, there's no danger in the moment. Now again, this is one of those caveats. If you are in danger in the moment, then that's a different thing. You want to work with others in your support systems to figure out a plan. But if you aren't in danger in the moment, that again, that's where our mind catastrophizes. Uh-oh, you're in trouble. Well, you bring yourself to the moment and say, actually, right now, in this moment, I'm actually safe, I'm happy, and you know, I'm, I'm here in my surroundings, I'm, I'm good. That's why God said, in my presence you'll feel joy. Because in the moment, that's what mindfulness is about, it's about just slowing everything down. Increased awareness can quickly lead to behavior change and more joy. Isn't it interesting that Romans 12, 2 says, will be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Isn't that fascinating that God didn't say, you'll be transformed by how you feel. He didn't say that. He said, I'll be you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So do you want to be transformed and experience joy? Then go to, okay, so what can I do in the moment? What can, can I call up a friend and get some encouragement from a friend? Can I go do some things we're going to talk about in just a second? Um, Matthew 6, 25 through 27, that's the few verses it talks about. Don't worry, you worried about your life, what you're going to eat or drink. And it talks about the little birds that God takes care of about the birds. And it's like, my lands, if God takes care of the birds, well, isn't he going to take care of you? What a, what, what a peaceful thing for us to think about and what a wonderful place for us to move to joy when we realize, wow, if God's taking care of the little birds, um, doesn't take care of me. I've been thinking about this this winter. I actually have one of my neighbors. Um, I, I have a little bird feeder thing that I put out and usually the squirrels eat all the stuff. I'm very sad for my little birdies. Um, well, my neighbor said, well, Rick, um, you know, when it gets really cold and it gets icy, do you like go out and so I have another little dish thing for water and the birds love it in the summer they flap around and, and drink water. Well, she said, when it freezes over, birds have a hard time finding water and so you need to go out there and kind of break it up a little bit. Um, so I do that. Well, I, sometimes I look out there and my, my cat, um, meow, you know how little cats are, meow, 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 meow. that's my cat, they're, they're little friends, that's what I call them. You know, we watch the birds and, well, if you think about that for a moment, so in the, this is mindfulness right now, what we're doing. In the moment, if we think about God cares for you, fill in your name, much more than he cares about those little birds that are looking for food and water this winter. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. That's how you get from anxiety to joy. Another way, distract yourself. What I would like you to not do for the next few minutes, let me repeat that, what I'd like for you not to do is to think about a white bear. <laughs> Please do not think in the next few minutes about a white bear. How many of you know who Bob Newhart is? Yeah, um, he's a comedian, and one of his most hilarious little vignette thingies, he pretended to be a psychiatrist, and this was way back in the day when psychiatrists would lay their patients on the couch, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And Bob Newhart um, saw this woman um, and her fear was being buried alive in a box. That would scare me. That, yeah, that, that's scary. And she was just freaked out about being buried alive in a box. And Bob Newhart would like just get this close to her, just get in her face. And he would say, stop it. And that's, he, so I, I moved away because, yeah, that's what he would do. He would yell, stop it. It's just, it kills you with laughter. It was just hilarious. And yet the profoundness of it, kind of the stupidity of it, really comes across. When we have an anxious mind, we can't just tell our minds, well, stop it. Stop being anxious, stupid. It just, our, our brains just don't work that way. So let go of the pressure. Don't feel guilty when you're anxious and you're worrying because it's just not how our minds work to say, well, stop worrying, stupid. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. What does work is to distract yourself to something pleasant and productive. Um, what is pleasant for you? Um, this book, I brought this book, I'm going to read a quote out of it, and, and I'll have it here afterwards if you're interested in looking at it. It's, one of, it's probably my favorite anxiety book. It's by, by Margaret Werenberg. It's called The Ten Best Ever Anxiety Management Techniques. Isn't that a great name for a book? I want to read that. Well, I have read it twice. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really outstanding. And that, that's what she says. Um, she says, she, take yourself to a pleasant and productive place. That's how you distract yourself. She also says in here, thought replacement, like going to a pleasant, productive, happy place, it is the key to successfully interrupting the anxious thoughts that burden the worried person. Let me read that again. Thought replacement is the key to successfully interrupting the anxious thoughts that burden the worried person. Isn't that great? Distraction is a very, very powerful tool to get from anxiety to joy, to take yourself to something that's happy for you. Um, I will be honest with you, I hate vacuuming. I really do hate vacuuming, I do. Um, but you know what? Um, I more hate my little kitty, Ari, I used to have an all-black kitty, and she passed away. It was very sad, and I got this new kitty from one of my daughters, um, and Ari is pure white. Well, I hate vacuuming, and when, I, when my thought process is, it's time to vacuum, I, I can't say I get anxious. I get more just irritable with myself. But my bigger and better reward where I can take my mind, my distraction is more than hating vacuum, I really like it when I can vacuum up all of Ari's white hairs all over the place. And I know I've got it all up and I can see it in the little, you know, why do they, in the vacuum things that you can see it now, you know, it's like, oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bigger, better reward is I can see it. That's the power of distractions. You take yourself to someplace else. Another one, meditation. We've kind of talked about that. Time with God. Um, there's a ton of calm apps um, right now. I've got one on my phone I could show you. Um, they're just great apps. Um, there's lots of tools you can use, like just picturing a happy place, and you tap into all five of your senses. It's called guided visualization, and you walk through what did you see and hear and touch and feel and taste. Um, meditation, of course, meditating on God and what and who God is, and you know that kind of stuff. Um, give your anxiety to God. Go to God. Meditate on God. Here's what Isaiah 41:13 says. I am the Lord your God who holds your right hand. Do not fear. I will help you. And then, of course, Philippians 4. We can't talk about anxiety and joy without talking about Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, with prayer and petition. Petition is just request. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And here's the catch. Or the result. And the peace of God will guard your heart, our emotions, and our mind. 
So meditating on God's goodness, meditating on scripture, meditating on what God wants to talk to you, what a wonderful way to let go of the anxiety and get to joy. Now, having said that, the next one, I purposely put this next, do something. Do something that produces joy and, and happiness. Like Margaret talks about in this book, do something pleasant or productive. Do something, the way I talk with my clients about it, do something that you know is actually going to produce the feeling of joy. So if you're anxious, actually thinking about, okay, what do I need to do that would create the feeling of joy for me? That's a wonderful thing to do. Um, let me just quickly read a couple things that she talks about in here, an example. Find opportunities to laugh. It's a great way to discharge tension. Or follow an impulse to do something small just because it's fun. Or look for fun activities that require physical energy output. Or identify what's pleasurable or unpleasurable and pay attention to the pleasurable experiences. So on and on the list goes. Do something fun. Um, what are a couple things that you know right now make you happy, make you laugh, kind of fun? You might want to write one or two of those things down for yourself and say, man, I haven't done that in a long time. We need to do more of that. And part of the problem is the culture we're living in, we're so caught up in go, 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 go. It's called TMA. You know what TMA stands for? Too much activity. Welcome to be living in America, huh? TMA, we are just going, 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 going. That's where the, a lot of the anxiety comes from. So being able to slow down. Music, music is a wonderful way to do something. Turn on music. You know, um, there's a ton of verses that talk about singing for joy to the Lord. And I'm not going to quote any of them, but you, know, you go to Psalms and it's all over the Psalms that singing is a wonderful way. In fact, the research shows us that singing uses more parts of our brain than worrying. Um, in Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, again, one of the world's leading experts on trauma, he talks a lot about things like singing, dancing, um, any sorts of movement, art. See, all those doing things, it's it, rather than keeping anxiety in, to get it out and do something pleasurable. Relax, 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 and rest. And that goes back to the TMA. We're too busy t TMAing, doing too much, versus just relaxing. How can we not be anxious when we're going at 200 miles an hour? It's really, really hard. It's really hard. Versus slowing down. Um, one of my favorite verses is Psalms 46.10. Be still and know I am God. Isn't that fascinating? God didn't say, well, go 200 miles an hour and then you'll know I'm God. It says, be still and know I am God. How do, how, how, do, how do you be still? Psalms 23, pretend you've never heard these two verses. Pretend you've never heard them. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. And you know what the next phrase is? When we lie down in green pastures and he leads us beside quiet waters, the next phrase is, he restores my soul. God did not paint the picture for us when we're going 200 miles an hour that our soul is going to be restored. Our soul is going to be restored from anxiousness and we're going to get to joy when we figure out what would laying down in the green pastures look like? What would going beside the quiet waters look like in life? What would that look like for you? What are your green pastures? What are your lying down or, or walking beside the quiet waters? What, what does that look like for you? So just a few more here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call these out even though I'm not going to talk about them because some of you would say, well, you'd go home thinking, well, why didn't Rick talk about that? Exercise, deep breathing, sleep. Those are all very, very important, and we could, we could and should spend 10 or 15 minutes on each one of those. And that's why I'm calling them out, because each one of them are very important. Sleep is huge. Um, also limiting caffeine and sugar. The research 
shows is definitive that both of those lead to more anxiety. And so if you're a caffeine hall, um, you know, if you drink a lot of caffeine, if you're, if you're a sugar holic, um, give that some thought. Is there a correlation there? Okay, just a few more. Develop a plan and implement it. So that goes back to if you're stuck in a situation where there is uncertainty, there is unsafety, our anxiety really decreases when we can problem solve. Take control of what you can. Look for choices. That's where it comes back to who are your supports to help you through that. Did you know that Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players ever, did you know he got kicked off his high school basketball team? Did you know that Steven Spielberg, one of the greatest movie directors America has ever had, he was rejected from film school, and now he's, he's been um, awarded four Academy Awards. Um, just two months ago, the NBA renamed their MVP trophy, the Michael Jordan Trophy. Both of those, if you, if you um, research Michael Jordan and Steven Spielberg, you'll learn about a plan they put together after they were rejected and felt lots of anxiety, that what they did to get out of that situation and to be successful and to feel joy. Let go rather than push hard. I've just got two more, this one and one other, and I'm gonna pull something out of my pocket here. Many times we're in anxiety because we're working too hard. Ever seen a Chinese, Chinese finger trap? You put your fingers in and then you pull hard to get out of the situation and it just gets worse and worse and worse. How you solve that is you just, you just push in. Oops, I pushed too hard. You just, you just let go and relax and it just comes right out. If you're pushing too hard in life, do you need to let go of something? Is that where you're going to find your joy? If that's you, I brought a few of these extra ones and feel free to help yourself. There, take one home as a reminder. The last one, gratitude. The research actually shows that giving thanks makes us 25% happier. Isn't that interesting? 25% happier. Folks, if you're feeling anxious, one of the ways to focus on something that will really be, will really create joy is gratitude. So what do you need to do today to move from anxiety and uncertainty to a place of, I can stand on this, here are some things I can do, I'm certain of God, I'm certain of my relationship with others, here's what I can stand on. I want to invite each one of you to, when you leave here and you get in your car and you go home, to think of two simple things you could do that would get you from anxiety to joy.